Harold and Sonia, the monarchs of Norway, today celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Hi everybody, I'm Phil Liggett and that's not the only anniversary being celebrated here in Norway. The cycling championships for the first time taking place and they're celebrating 100 years. But let's go back one year now to 1992 to Benidorm in Spain, the last running of the World Professional Road Race Championship and this was the second straight victory by Gianni Bugno of Italy. He now defends his title here for the second year and is aiming for a third straight title. It's on a course in the downtown area of Oslo and this the first time these championships have been brought together in the Scandinavian area. 171 starters on the start line and the weather completely different to the yesterday where the World Amateur Road Race Championship was won by the young German teenager Jan Ulrich. The Italians know they have a lot on their plate. They're defending now for a man who has worn the rainbow jersey for the past two years. And again, he's not had a very good season either. Now can he pull one out the bag and make it three? The weather is atrocious. It's not only wet, it's also extremely cold. And the riders are thickly wrapped up. There's the man with the weight of the world on his shoulders, Gianni Bugno. And this is not the weather he would have liked at all. They would have much preferred the sun and warmth of the day before because it really was most pleasant. And Miguel Ingerain, like Stephen Roach, like Eddie Merckx, still on for the big three, the Tour de France, the Giro d'Italia and the World Championship. All smiles. He was sixth last year when he was trying for the top three. Now he's got one more shot, having won both of those great events yet again. Well, the gun goes and nobody is going to be in any particular hurry here to break away. They're expecting the best part of six and a half hours in the saddle. And if these conditions do persist, then they are going to be very, very miserable indeed. Takes me back to the start, actually, in Villach in Austria in 1987, where the rain was very heavy and it was very cold. The sun came out in the end, and that was where Stephen Roach won his world championship and did the big three. Roach riding today his last world championship and all set to retire at the end of this season. The great Irishman, I'm sure, will attempt to go out of this race with a bang. Warmth, the order of the day. The cold spray of the bicycle wheels now splattering on the faces of the riders in the centre of that pack. It's rather like an acclimatisation period they hadn't hoped for here. It does show, though, the risks that can be involved in running a world title race as we go into September in the Northern Hemisphere where the weather is on the turn. The snows are only four or five weeks away here. But you have to say that the Norwegian people have turned on the championships here in style. This is the route the riders face. It's on a circuit of 11 and a half miles, making a total distance of 161 miles over 14 laps. There are two climbs, the first coming after one and a half miles, the second one coming at around about four miles and finishing at the top at 5.2 miles. It is a course which is not terribly hilly, some 300 metres above sea level, that's all at the highest point, but it is going to be very, very difficult in these conditions and indeed the long climb that takes the riders up to the feed, I think, will present us with a war of attrition towards the end. That's how it fits into the beautiful scene here in Scandinavia, and there in kilometres is the overall distance. Total climbing of 3,500 metres today. And now, on these early laps, we look at the riders beginning to stretch, and straight away a crash where we've only just got out of town because we're at the foot of the first climb here, which comes after 1.5 miles, and the riders are already in a little bit of a tangle. There's always this big risk, it's the sort of problems that you would normally expect in the amateur racing, not with the top professional riders. But you can see that a touch of wheels in these very, very greasy conditions are leaving riders in trouble. Looks like Dirk Decker in as well. It's in fact Gert Jan Ternisse, who's down on the right there. And Ternisse up and away. <laughs> the usual chaos at the back of the race when a rider has a crash like that. This is the start of the first climb. It goes on for about two miles. A little bit of a false flat in the middle before he kicks again, taking the riders up to the three and a half miles point. Well, for the last few days, the top professionals of the world have been arriving here in Oslo. Most of them didn't take part in the track series down in Harmer, which is about 70 miles away. Sidi Claverola in the center of our picture there, former king of the mountains in the Tour de France and doing the right thing, holding himself right at the front. Easy to say, not so easy to do, but keeping out of trouble. The riders have already expressed their concern about this course in the wet because we go down a long, steep descent back down towards the city. 
This is the false flat here. As they make the flick and then they'll start the climb again. Also a very, very difficult corner in these conditions. The crowds are certainly down too because yesterday they were out in their thousands to watch the amateur race, but it was warm sunshine and it was a most pleasant day. And I wonder if we saw yesterday too in the victory of the 19-year-old Jan Urich from Germany a new Eddie Merckx because Eddie Merckx was the last man to win at 19 years of age and we all know what happened to him as the years unfolded. And at last, an attack getting underway very early on. And I think this is Carlos Maya of Venezuela who's put on the first attack, testing the water. An awful long way to go, but he's anticipating a world championship, but you've got to start somewhere and he's got the gap, but the race is lined out. And the counter-attacks are bringing him back. A Dutch rider here. The Dutch riders, like the Italians, like the French, will ride for one man, but they'll wait to see which one of the men can establish the leadership of the team. And then once they've established the leadership of the team, then they'll work to defend him. So there'll be a lot of touching the water here and just testing out what's going on. Danny Nelson is the rider coming up. And not willing to work with the young Venezuelan at all. The whole field closes down. Well, that horrible feeling of cold rain hitting you will have eased a little bit now as they become completely wet. This is round the back of the harbour. Very slippery stretch of road. The pits are actually beneath us there where the riders come through. And yesterday in the World Amateur title, it was chaos down there. There were so many people trying to pass up drinks and bags and feeds. Seems to be a lot better organised today for the World Professional title. The centre of Oslo closed down. I have to say that the authorities here have done a marvellous job on the organisation. They've been working on it for the best part of three years. One or two disappointments when they put in bids, but they finally landed the big one, celebrating 100 years of sight. And the big face in the middle there is Adri van der Poel from Holland. And you can see the riders here all trying to peer around the spray of the wheel behind. There's the first lap completed in 26 minutes, and that's a very good time as we see now, the small gap is being timed there on the one rider, and in fact, there are two of them now. Now, this is Maya who's gone away again, but he's been joined by a Japanese rider, Takehiro Yamada. And the two riders are clear. Well, the Japanese have provided us in the past with one or two great track riders, but none yet on the road. But each time we see them race, they're providing us with one or two more riders, one riding on the Motorola team this year. Perhaps the finest cyclist of all time to come out of Japan, Koichi Nakano, the world championship for a decade in the sprint. It was the sprint, by the way, that started the world titles back in 1893 in Chicago. The first World Road Racing Championship going to the Nürburgring in Germany. That was back in 1927 and won by the great Italian Alfredo Binda. Now, cold legs beginning to warm to the climb. They won't be too concerned by the attack from these two unlikely riders, uh, Yamada and Maya. And this descent here is very, very greasy indeed. No chances taken. The corner itself has been taken off. You can see the new bit of road down there. That was to take off the junction to allow a better swing to the next start of the second part of the climb. And these really are the conditions that the organisers feared most. These roads are not very wide, as you can see. And we've got one rider chasing in between here. Let's see if we can catch a glimpse of him. It's an Austrian rider who's gone through. And he's allowed a little bit of a gap over the field. The Austrians, who have provided for some great amateur riders in recent years, but they don't get a lot of success at professional level. And there's a faller right on the corner, and somebody has touched a wheel, and the pileup is following. Well, these are the fears confirmed. There's an Italian rider down. And this is the start now of the crashes, I think, because the riders are very, very worried about these descents. If you touch your brakes, there's a little bit too much, you're down on the ground and there's a rider hurt there. And just having a look down, but one of the riders is quite badly hurt, I think. He's landed on his collarbone. Now let's have a look at that in slow motion here. Look back to the centre of the picture where the trouble starts. A touch of wheels, I think. 
and the ricochet effect is riders actually touching their brakes. They're not even falling or hitting the riders who have fallen. They're falling off independently because they're braking and they're losing the wheels. And this is another one. This is further along. The camera's picked up another one here. Kai Hunter marked is one rider who is trying to straighten out his bike, the Motorola Professional, and it's clearly damaged. And I think that under the car there is Philippe Luvio, former champion of France, and he doesn't look at all well. Luvio certainly out of the race. Well, this is all happening on the third lap, and the breakaway still on with Takahiro Yamada and Carlos Maya, but quite frankly the race is preoccupied now by the falls at the back and that is a sad end for a very very talented cyclist Philippe Luvio he's carried off the course and onto hospital and there's the time gap, a minute 21 seconds and these two riders swapping turns at the front quite well but you can see by the camera lens uh, just what the conditions are like. It's not just wet, by the way, it is extremely cold. And this is another crash here, and this is indeed another sad sight. Another rider on the floor. And this is uh, Peter Verbecken from Belgium, who made the selection for the World Championships. He rides one of the small Belgian teams, and he's done well to get selection, but he's out now. And this is another one of the difficult bends too. I think now one or two of the riders here are going to feel very, very nervous on these corners. What a magnificent sight that is though, as the riders spiral away back up. And again, I think there are more problems. Look at this now, these riders falling on every corner. They really aren't going to know what to do next now. These are two, uh, two uh, Colombian riders who've gone down and thankfully the rest have managed to go around them. Well, this isn't the weather that Mr. Jaramillo would like from Colombia. Venezuelan rider setting the pace at the front, Maya. And the chase down by the Italians, just keeping the race in touch. They're not too worried about this breakaway. They know it is the, the carrot that's gone out in front now. They're not too worried about those two riders. They're not going to be the world champions by the end of the day. Much too far to go. But they will watch for a possible counter-attack that could contain some strong men. And the gap is tumbling down. Just 20 seconds now on this fourth circuit. A long break. I think it was a gamble that they took and hoped that somebody else would come up, but the bunch are on them now. I think the gap's about eight or nine seconds. Well, you can see it for yourself. Five seconds on the corner. And they've crashed on that zebra crossing, that crossing on the road has proved too slippery. It was the Japanese rider who fell first. And that has put the race right on the tail. The Dutch riders are up alongside them. And they pull them back. And now we can see there with our slow motion camera, watch them when they hit the whites, and down they go. Well, that's the way to end the breakaway. Out in the lead almost since the opening of the championship, and then suddenly back in the race, and you've got no chance. Now we're going to start to see a counter-attack here, I think. As the riders start to go away. Well, you'd expect the Dutch riders to do this. They take risks all the time. But the field, more or less, is back together. It's difficult to appreciate the gradient of the climb from the helicopter there, but it is quite a nasty little climb, especially at the speed that this bunch is going up the climb. They've got a very good, fast tempo. And Tilly Clavarola dancing away on the pedal, stays up near the front of the peloton. Stephen Roach, Martinelli, still both in the centre of the pack. Now this probably is the most difficult descent. King Harold, by the way, that's his residence, is coming down to see the finish today. And there he is, celebrating his 25th wedding anniversary with Queen Sonia. And quite a big day for him too. He's going to come down and he's going to give an audience to the world champion, whoever that will be, by the end of the day. A 
And it's good to see the corners are well barriered here because one or two riders have already uh, tested the band. Another one's gone, and a German rider is down this time, and that has caused the ricochet once more. An Italian fell as well, and just look at this carnage. You would think somebody sprayed the main field here with machine gun fire. They've fallen all over the road, and they must be getting sick and tired of this. There's a Belgian rider looking a little bit hurt to the left of our picture. The Italians seem OK. And trying to get back into the action. Well, fortunately, the back of the field were able to slow down there. But the tall Belgian rider is not at all feeling good here. He's in a little bit of trouble. Mark Vouters. And he doesn't look as though he's too keen because, unfortunately, the draw for his car was a long way down the caravan. Took a while to get some assistance. And again, we can see how it's happened. It's rather like the British Grand National, this. And I reckon you will call this one the Canal Turn, which is one of the famous portions of the Grand National Circuit. And it usually claims a few, but not as many as this. And still the pressure being applied at the front as the Italians continue to fall at the back. Well, there's a couple of riders the Italians will try to work for today, but by the end of all these crashes, you're going to have to ask yourself the question, who can they work for? Van der Poel trying to get some action in the line here. Realising they may have a split on and the time to start working well. Great bike hander, Adrie van der Poel. Silver medalist on a number of occasions in the World Cyclocross Championship. He can handle his bike well, and these conditions will suit him. And so racing now for just over two hours and a 27-minute lap. But they're still averaging, despite these conditions, 25 miles an hour. That's a very, very good ride indeed. Stephen Roach, determined to go to the end today. Riding his last World Championship, and memories at the moment, no doubt the same as they were at Vilac as he rode along in the rain. But by the end of the day, he was the World Champion and he completed the hat-trick. Well, it was only about four or five weeks ago, Stephen was saying to me that he didn't realise quite what he achieved back in 1987. I don't suppose it, uh, when you've done it, you can realise it, but winning the Tour de France like he did, hot on the heels of a brilliant Tour of Italy after the arguments he had with his team captain, Roberto Vicentini. And then, of course, and this is another crash. Well, this is amazing. And this is Jean-Francois Bernard, former third place in the Tour de France for him, and now on the faithful side of Miguel Ingerain, and he looks as though he's hurt his foot. And Moreno Argentine is down as well. The man who won the world title in 1986 in Colorado Springs, when it was held in the United States for the first time, and it looks to me as though Argentine has hurt his leg there and could well be out the race, but Bernard is going to go on. Well, it's a long, long time, if ever, there's been a world championship quite like this, because the riders are falling not just on the bends, but on the straight as well, and the problem is the white line down the centre of the road, I think they're also slipping on there. This is how this one happened. I don't know how our camera managed to get in amongst this one, but there's Argentine to the left. And rolling in agony is Jean-Francois Benard. And I think Argentine is going to retire. Leader of the Giro d'Italia this year, which uh, I hope that you've managed to see on our special edition tape of that event, because it was a very interesting race indeed. And the crowd, hats off to them because they're returning. They're all Italians. They're all the great Italians who support their riders around the world. They've set up their camp. They've flown the Italian flag. And now they're waving to their team. But they'll be disappointed when the news reaches them with the demise there of Merino Argentine. Well, not surprisingly, the field a little bit happier now to come back into order, led by Gert Jan Ternisse. Sean Kelly going through our camera lens there. Stephen Roach grimacing a little bit, but enjoying it. Martin Early in the other green jersey. There's Eric Broikink.
Nobody now very anxious at all. I would imagine they're extremely nervous and wondering where the next fall is going to come. There's a brave man riding no hand in the centre. One of the Norwegian riders. So we're in the heart of lap number six now. Pedro Delgado, winner of the Tour de France in 1988. And now been pushed into second place on the Bonesto team by the fine riding these last three years of Miguel Ingerain, Charlie Motte. And talking there to Bernard Eno, the manager of the French team. Five times winner of the Tour de France, of course, and I'm probably quite pleased he's got the heater on in that car today. And Motte, the big comeback, had a very solid Tour de France when you consider that uh, really his season was ruined with an early season crash this year that uh, broke his leg. You know, a perfectionist indeed, as serious in his management of a team as he most certainly was when he was a great cyclist. No sign at all of this weather easing. You look out across the, the ocean here and all you see are dull, dank, grey skies. Riders coming around the back of the castle. Oh, and this, well, that was a crazy fall. That was a crazy fall. That was right on the line of the centre of the road, and it looked like it was a Belgian rider who fell, who was setting the tempo, and the riders just looked to see who it was and went straight round him. It's Atlee Pedersen who's setting the pace. Now, let's have a look who it was, because it looks as though he's hurt. And again, confusion in the ranks, but this is Alain, it's the champion of Belgium here, Alain van den Bosch, and it looks to me as though his elbow or his collarbone is most certainly broken. Well, I think, uh, you know, there have been grounds here to possibly call off this championship, but how can you do that when the preparation has gone into it? But let's have a look again. What's the centre of the picture now? As van der Bosch comes across the yellow strip in the middle and his wheels simply go away from him. And how on earth there wasn't a major crash there with all of the riders right behind him, I don't know. But the peloton has seen it. They've fanned out around him. Pedersen going off to our left. And there you can see from the air just how he took out a, a Dutch rider as well. And one of the Spanish riders gone down with him. This is Atlee Pedersen. He was absolutely delighted that uh, after a career, he was a very good amateur rider. He's now able to ride the World Pro title on his own ground, although I think he would have wished for better weather conditions. This is Alain van den Bosch again, and uh, they're doing a pretty rough job here of strapping him up, ready for the trip to hospital, just to hold the bones together, because they obviously suspect either a broken collarbone or elbow. So we're moving out towards lap number eight. And an attack now by Stephen Roach. Roach is going to say goodbye, certainly uh, with honours, that's for sure. He wants to make sure that the television cameras remember the man who in 1987 won the world title. And look at this, a fine piece of acceleration by Roach. One of the Norwegians has grit his teeth and got onto his wheel there. But Roach has certainly strung out those riders. But he's going nowhere. I think it's more the sure bravado by Stephen here. Just a chance to show people he's still here. He had a terrific Tour of Italy and a terrific Tour de France for his final year. This is Atlee Pedersen attacking. Roach looks over his shoulder. The legs are hurting a bit now. One or two surprising faces now at the front of that peloton. And this is the feeding station. But nobody in any hurry to grab any food. Just over the top then. Riders then making their right turn and Atlee has gone clear. Well, once they see these rather attractive colours of the Norwegians, we don't get to see professionals riding their national team colours too often. And these certainly are new colours for Norway. Now, let's see what he's done, see if he can bring somebody up here. Might start to produce uh, a counter-attack, perhaps. 
Oh dear me, no. The whole field is up. Quickly regrouped, but of the 171 starters now, I would say that bunch is looking to me to be probably around about 80 men left in this race. Some brave Norwegians. Well, the weather that they will come to expect for the next few months indeed. This is a, the model of a Viking ship, which normally takes people out around the bay. And it's now finished its summer toy season. It comes to rest in the harbour. Well, despite the weather, there still seems plenty of riders willing to turn on the style. The professional riders, they go out in all sorts of weather. They really never complain a lot. There's Adrie van der Poel. He's been dirtier than this, though, when he's been racing to a world silver medal in cyclocross these last few years. And I remember him making a spectacular crash at the World Cyclocross Championships earlier this year when he failed to jump a ditch on his bike, his front wheel went down it and he catapulted off it and went straight through the pits without a bicycle. Andy Hampston, the earpiece there, his contact to the team manager, out of his ear. Probably had enough of what Jim Okovic might have wanted to say today in these conditions. Zenon Yaskula, what a marvellous July he had, finishing third in the Tour de France. Highest ever finish for Poland. And the Poles are tough riders too. These conditions might suit him today. There's still a lot of blue jerseys down there too for Italy. Gianni Bugno's still there. Claudio Chiapucci and talking to Bugno, we've seen nothing of him yet at all. And there's somebody else is down, somebody's down. The bike is in the centre of the road. This is also a hazard. The rider himself is trying to get his bike back and has, a, has hurt his left leg too. I can't spot them from the helicopter who they are, but it looks to me as though we've got a Spanish rider in trouble and an American rider calling for service. Well, this really is too bad. This is the worst corner of the course. There's so many riders been falling here. But the field go on. Led by the Dutch riders. Van der Poel never far away from the front. And uh, the Tête de la Course, the head of the race, the riders are all together. The Italians may be getting this race back into their little wing here because it's the sort of race that is going to, I think, give us a surprise. The crowd are coming out to see the passage of the race come through and then they're all darting into doorways and coffee shops to await its next trip round because these laps are 11 and a half miles around and it's being covered throughout its entirety on television here as well. And so the riders, quite understandably, are going to keep this race together as long as possible. The climb out comes very soon after the start, a mile and a half down the road, they start to climb again. Bjorn Rees, Looking for a little bit of help here from the Danish team. And certainly the Scandinavians are anxious to impress. And Bjorn Rees, now part of the new setup in Denmark. Because now the Danish riders are earning what they can see as big money with the success on Danish television of this sport. More than 70 hours of the Tour de France was given on Danish television this year. And Rees responded with a fine ride. Constant attacks coming all the way. Trying to get something together. Tall, thin legs here of Frankie Andreu, keeping the stars and stripes up front as well. What a solid rider he is. Almost rewarded with a stage win in this year's Tour de France. Very, very good rider, fast finisher. Could be his day today in these conditions too. Now you can see the attack here by Frankie and the counter-attacks coming from behind. Just trying to hang on to his wheel rather than counter the move as they put the pressure on. Jan Rees going through there. Seems to have been caught in the middle of having his lunch when the attack came, but Andreo has been caught by the field. And once again, all together.
We're now reaching the stage of the race where the tired legs, the cold legs, are going to take their effect here. And the pressure is now being applied by the big names, and that's what they'll be from now on as they try to sense now just who is left with any strength in this race and the nerve to want to continue. Dagota Lauritsen, nearest the camera, unhappy when he lost his place with Motorola and what a great season he's had with TVM. Stage win in the Kellogg's Tour of Britain, amongst his other big victories this year. And I'm sure has trained especially for this world title on home ground. Still remembers with sadness the crash he had with Dirk de Wolf when we were in 1990 in Japan. Fabio Rossioli won the stage of the Tour de France. And uh, he said if he did, he'd take all his neighbours out to dinner, which he did, but it cost him a lot of money. There were 25 of them. It was in his long breakaway this year down on the south of France. Now this is an interesting little break that's starting to get itself together here and Dagotto feels now is the time to start moving up towards the front. Heading up towards lap number nine and now. And this little breakaway is the first serious move of the bigger names in the race. There's no longer the shadow boxing now. They've realized that at any moment somebody could go down and ruin the championship. And now they're trying to seek out a select group. Delgado coming up. Just latches on to the end. And moves very, very rapidly up towards the leaders. The face now of... Dagota Lauritsen tries to get something working very, very hard here. This is the sort of breakaway. And look at this, Dagota Lauritsen wants a little bit more help and he's not really receiving it here. I think uh, the Spanish rider that uh, came up there too should have really started to work with him. It was Garospe of Spain. Garospe, I think, would be more interested to see the arrival of Big Mig, Miguel Indurain, because he's the rider, I think, who is the man that they still hope can pull off the big triple and join the legendary Eddie Merckx and, indeed, Stephen Roach. Well, that's an interesting breakaway. Yaskul has got up there as well, I think. The whistle blows to warn the riders. Oh dear me, and they've gone down again. Another series of... And there's Decker on the floor again. As now the Belgians once more in the pile-up, and this time with the Danes. And look at that. Uh, Decker on the right of our picture, and I think that is his third crash today. Well, one thing, he's learned to be a really hard professional bike rider because it looks it's just a matter of straightening his bike, and he's going to be back on the road yet again. You can see here now, and it's the rider there who goes down, the German rider. Decker falls in sympathy there. And then the others on the left of our picture simply run out of road and can't get round. And this in over the barrier is Raul Alcala. Alcala has gone over the barrier here. Well, I can tell you he's been very, very lucky indeed because there was a tram went down these tracks not a couple of minutes previously. I don't think anybody anticipated riders falling over the safety fences onto that track. But if you're involved in a pile-up and there's nowhere to go, I guess you go over the fence. And Alcala, very, very fortunate indeed. Winner of the Tour du Pont this year, just ahead of Lance Armstrong. And looking a bit shaken. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. And Alcala, I think, will call it a day here. as He comes back over the fence. Well, the medical team on the World Championships will never forget this one in Norway. And the brilliant Mexican rider who uh, won the big race for Word Perfect this year, the Tour du Pont, a uh, team that hasn't enjoyed a great, a great season, first year in the sport. But that's what cycle racing is. Sometimes they don't all come good. Well, we'll get back up to the race here. And again, you can see now the rain has turned once more into a deluge. Maurizio Fondrias going through. What a marvellous season he's had almost certain to pick up the World Cup for the second time by the end of this year. And Fondria still in the decisive moves.
Now the action for me again, thick and fast. Heinz Imboden of the Swiss team through on the inside there. I think that's little Charlie Motte leading them through as well from France. He's still very much in the thick of it. But still looking for a chink in the armour. A sign that there are riders here stronger than the others. Tiri Claverola moving up on the outside. A lot of Italian riders still bringing the men to the fore. The Italians taking confidence over these last couple of years by the brilliant riding of Gianni Bugno. Certainly the spectators and the press are always very hard on the Italian riders. If they don't perform, they really do take a hammering both in the newspapers and by the spectators. They want results all of the time. And they've had a few good ones over these last few years too. <laughs> but not from this young man. Well, even if the riders have been in the saddle now for the best part of four hours, I'm afraid he won't have any chance of keeping up with these. Claudio Chiapucci moving to the fore now. Roscioli still here, inspired by his stage win in the Tour de France. This is the sort of breakaway now that we would want to see start to think of consolidating itself. You can hear the shouts for Italia coming all the time from the left of the road. The spectators seem to outnumber everybody else on this course. It's not been a great day for spectators, that's for sure. And it looks as though we've got a nice little group here trying to work his way clear, and a powerful group it is too. Slight split in the field, at least but they're over the top. Once over the top of this climb, yet again, it should come back together. There's Frankie Andreo still there, very much in the thick of it. And it's Imboden setting the pace. And surprisingly, there's still a big bunch of riders here. They start the greasy descent once more. I think now the spectators are coming to these corners more to watch the fun and games and to watch who's leading the World Championship. And the flag being held to our right, I think that's the colours of Latvia. As the riders uh, come through, and still a lot of riders now, this race is beginning to split, that's for sure, because as soon as they come down this climb, they will start the next ascent. And it could well be now that the pressure at the front is beginning to crack a lot of men. And there's somebody, and I think it's an attack by Norway. It is indeed a Norwegian rider who's starting to go clear here. So it's Bo Andre Namvent who's gone. Rides on an American team, Subaru Montgomery. No immediate reaction. Andreo on the outside nearest camera. Kiapucci climbing in second place, just watching who's gone up the road. The Norwegian may sense that the time is becoming nice and ripe. And Namvent has gone clear. An interesting move this, because the Norwegians really have arisen to the occasion. They've had, this is the third different Norwegian rider we've had attack. And it looks as though they're taking it with a lot more serious intent now. The Italians deciding they must start to bring him back. So Bo André. Going clear over the top at Ekberg again. Little look over his shoulder, might be a useful little group. If they can get across as a group and not as a bunch, they've got something to work on. Vastly underrated rider, Namvent. Third this year in the United States.
A lot of riders now looking for others to make the chase. Uh, there's Dagotto going through. Seem to acknowledge uh, somebody on the left of the picture. They may have told him that Namvent has launched the attack because for the moment at least they're on the same team today. And the counter-attack coming. And there's a couple of Onsei riders. This is Hodge on the nearest the camera there, the Australian rider, but these are two teammates together. And they're going to try and start working together now if they can. Well, Stephen Hodge survived a long day. He hasn't had the great season he had last year. He's trying desperately now to stay in the picture. But that's wiped out as well. Field all back together. The Italians feeling now they might be bringing this race a little bit back together again. Charlie Motte trying to move into the action at the front. But look how gingerly they're now taking these right-hand bends. They're well aware now just how dangerous this course is. They've never been allowed to rest because they've been using so much nervous tension up knowing that every corner they've gone round, they've had to watch carefully for the riders falling. The Italians have got themselves organised. Little intrusion from the French too, as they try to come through on the near side. But this bunch is refusing to go and crack under this pressure. They're scrabbling back. It's probably down to about 65, 70 riders now. The other Frenchman I've seen being very active up and near the front is Bruno Cornier. And that gives you some idea now just how bad this weather conditions really are. Heading up towards the feed again. And that's the view from our second motorbike mounted cameraman. Oops, a day to then, you know, almost again. The German rider snatching the bag there almost went down. They really have had some near misses today too and the Germans have been on the floor along with the Dutch and this is a Dutchman too being pushed back into the race. And it looked as though it could have been Franz Massen being shoved off too. Nearly five hours completed now. And the riders completing their lap number 11. Just look at these conditions. And these riders down the line are really more interested just hanging onto the wheel in front than to think of attacking just at the moment. The long descent, every rider craning his neck to see around the corner. There's still no decisive move, and I would think that we have to say that the rain has stopped any initial long attacks here. We haven't really seen any breakaway at all get off the front of this race since the early attack of those two riders from Japan and Venezuela. One or two riders have tried, but without a great deal of success. They've made 100 metres, perhaps 200 metres, but no real time gaps at all. Kiapuchi looking to see if anybody's willing to launch an attack. Just checking, in fact, to see if the acceleration on the climb has opened a gap. There is a, certainly a little gap here. And Keir Pucci anxious to see now what he can attack and what he can draw out of this. And I can't blame him for that. Claudio Keir Pucci, the sort of rider who you know uh, will try anything at any time, has always worries the rest of the field because they never know when Claudio is going to launch an attack. It's Bjarni Ries who's gone with him and gone by him. Well, every time a Scandinavian rider hits the front, uh, they get the cheers they deserve. And Keir Pucci's committee getting back onto the wheel of Reese. 
What a magnificent rider Kipuchi is. He always keeps trying his luck and occasionally it works out for him. And now the gap at the front. Reese has proved magnificent again today, adding to his brilliant Tour de France, along with the stage victories there as well of uh, Jesper Skibbe, who has had a bad crash today, by the way. We haven't seen him on camera, but he's been rushed away to hospital. That's, uh, that really is very, very sad for Jesper Skibbe, who just recovered from a serious crash in Tirano Adriatico. And... Uh, had that marvellous highlight in the Tour de France at Evreux this year when he won the stage. And now, news reaching us, he's out again with another maybe serious injury. And there's an awful lot of pressure being applied at the front now, particularly from the Norwegian riders, and that's good to see. Pedro Delgado. Perico, as they call him, and still a very, very game cyclist. He's taken the the brunt of the force of criticism well since Injurain became the top man on the team. He's always uh, aligned himself to Injurain. He remembers the time when Injurain actually helped him ride so well in the Tours de France and now the favour being returned. This is Long Dufour, I think, of Switzerland, who's come up to the front. Alex Zula, I think it was Alex Zula, in fact, who just latched on the back of this attack. Franz Massen. Now this is an interesting move, very interesting move indeed now as the riders start to pull themselves together. Little group trying to get clear here. Alex Zula of Switzerland has made this split. Well, not too many more climbs to come in these conditions, and the rain, it seized off a little bit, but it's threatening all of the time. The roads remaining very, very treacherous indeed. This World Championships has held together this field as big as this. I'm very surprised indeed that it hasn't split up. It says a lot for the standard of the professional cyclists, because I would have think in an amateur race there would have been major problems today, as if there haven't been enough problems indeed before in this race as well. Andre Schmil, who's tried to get up there too. From Moldavia. And that's him in third place in the white cape. And give him his head in a sprint and he might well finish off and be the first champion to come from his country. Pace behind the spot and again. A tremendous attack from him this time. He is really trying to break up this field. Zuller's left to set the pace there, but the counter-attacks are coming. And Bon Rees has attacked again with an absolute flyer down that road. And didn't quite catch hold of the Italian there who chased him. But certainly the counter-attacks by the big name surely must answer now. They know that Rees is being drawn to the finish here in Scandinavia. He's not a Norwegian, he's a Dane. But he is enjoying his finest ever season. Released of the duties now of working for Moreno Argentin this year who was on the Ariostia team. Now, of course, Argentine moved across to a new team. And Argentine is out of the World Championship today with a crash. I think that is David Cassani who's trying to get across there to Bjorn Rees. Oh, well, it doesn't really matter now, does it? Because he's hit the, hit the deck completely. And I think, in fact, it's a Frenchman who's kind of come across. Not an Italian at all, but Reese made the corner well and very skillfully. And the French rider has been picked up there by the chase group, which appears to be still that big field. Now Bjorn Reese continues his solo break here. And this is a marvellous piece of riding by Bjorn Reese. Not looking over his shoulder at all. He can't surely feel he's going to race this to victory. He's got to have some help in these conditions. It's very cold. And I would imagine that one of the big fears now in these conditions would be cramp. There's the first gap on Reese, just 12 seconds. Not a lot, in fact. But you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? 
Still a lot of orange jerseys of Holland in this league group. Certainly the blue jerseys of it Italy and also one or two of the good Frenchmen are still left in this race. There's Rees heading round the back of the castle here down by the harbour, coming through to complete the end of this lap. And the spray there coming off his wheels. We want to watch out on those yellow lines because they claimed Alain van den Bosch of Belgium, the Belgian champion, as we saw earlier. And it looks as though the serious chase is being left to the challenge. Well, that's the pressure of being the defending country, in effect, with Gianni Bunio, the world champion these past two years. Through the feeding station, and the cheers are there for Scandinavia. Deservedly so. Rees fifth in the Tour de France this year. Superlative performance for the first few days. We all thought that he would crack, but he didn't. He survived the passage of the Alps and the Pyrenees so well. And now, will he survive what is going to be a long, lonely ride to the finish of these World Championships? 23 miles to race. And Bjorn Rees has taken the offensive. And what a finish it would be if he survived for two laps. Surely he can't do that. Almost five and a half hours in the saddle. The car headlights now lighting the way in what are very dismal circumstances here in Oslo. And the crowd, I have to hand it to them, has grown considerably here with the greatest names in the world racing for the first time in Norway. And the cheers, well, you can hear them for yourself now as Bjarni Rees goes through with two laps to go. A Danish rider out in front. And a very quick lap indeed, yet again. Almost 26 miles an hour. Well, the field of chasing, but I wouldn't call it a determined chase right now. It's just over 20 seconds, the gap. There's nobody, it seems, willing to help the Italians in the chase down. They've got a split in that big field as well right now, but this bunch is small now. The lap-by-lap -lap communication sheets which we see are now listing an awful lot of riders having abandoned the race. They're slipping out at the back of the course. But the one that we should note, Gianni Bugno has called it a day, so there'll be no third title for him and no fairy tale either. The weather has never been on his side. Now, but can he be on the side of this man, Bjorn Rees? He's searching for the gear that might help him up the hill that's just about to come. But you know, he's still worried about the proximity of the chase, and even at this stage, he might be happier if one or two riders did join him. But the chase down is coming mainly from the field, and it's the Italians who are doing it. And there they are. At the front of the race there is Bruno Kengialta, and the man doing the work with him is Farazin. And those are the two riders trying now to keep this race together. And I can only think they're doing it for the two leaders, the two leaders who are left, and that's Maurizio Fondriest and Claudio Chiapucci. They're probably the only two men who could finish the job off now for Italy. And they're both in that group. The group, well, looking at it, it's about 35, 40 riders still left with a shot at this World Championship. And certainly these two are prepared to sacrifice everything for it. This is Farazin. And a fine piece of pacemaking he's doing here to bring back Bjorn Rees. Holding him at the moment. Rees going out onto the climb yet again. One more time around this course after this. And there isn't a man in this race won't be sorry when this World Championship rolls to an end. It's been a tough one. Perhaps there's no more than 35 riders in that chase group now. They're trying to sort themselves out for the big chase down. One or two riders still along for the ride too. They try to keep an eye on it. But the Italians talking to each other, anxious to get this chase over. They want Bjorn Rees back in the pack. He's setting a tremendous pace out here. Something like 26 miles an hour. No real organised chase because nobody wants to assist the Italians. The Italians always ride like this in a World Championship. They ride very well as a team. 
because they share the spoils equally should they get the world champion on the squad by the end of the day and they're also on a big payout uh, from the Italian Cycling Federation which is a little bit different to most teams. Now this is where the hill begins to bite again. Three Italians in the first six riders and you've got four Italians in the top ten. But there's still a couple there protected and they'll be, they'll be Fondriest and Chiapucci. The wet and tired legs of Bjorn Rees. He keeps looking over his shoulder and that is not a good sign actually. You keep on looking backwards, you're not concentrating on setting the pace that will keep you away from the field. And I think they're beginning to chase him down. He still looks quite cool and collected despite the effort he's been making. In fact, some of the Italian pacemakers now begin to feel the pace too. They're dropping back a little bit. There's Chiapucci near the camera as he went past us there. But there you are, we can see it for ourselves now. There's a very nice little group coming up here. They've cracked us, cracked ahead of the bunch on the climb. And now we'll see what the Italians have to offer because they've chased very hard indeed to bring this breakaway back. And the obvious move is to now launch an attack. I wonder if they can. They're literally diving for wheels as they go around that top bend because there is a group of about eight or nine men, I think, trying to get clear. The Italians are closing in. Fondriest is the rider setting the pace, and there we are, that's what it was all done for. Fondriest responding now to the hard work of Kengi Alta and Farazan. As he now tries to wipe up this world championship, he'd love to wipe away the memories of that uh, rather lucky win, as they referred to it. Uh, back in the late 80s when Steve Bauer and uh, Claude Coquillion had that head-on clash. Well, it was Fondriest who nipped round the fighting riders to finish up the world title holder. There he is on the left of our picture, Gerard Rouet, just behind him in second place. Looks as though he spent the last six hours down a coal mine, frankly. And Gertie Antonis are trying to get across the gap as well. Still a lot of riders prepared to grit their teeth here and try and close the gap for one final time. A selection is not far away. David Cassani down the back end looking to see who is behind. OK, Pucci's the little rider in blue at the back here. And looking to be following a wheel through with an intent to attack. Olaf Ludwig, this rider, Olympic champion in Seoul in 1988. Former East German, of course, turned very late in his career. And Franz Massen is having a dig as well. I think Kierpucci's flown away. I think Kierpucci is gone. And Claude Coquillion is trying to have a go. And the rider is coming up just behind him now, I think, is Gerard Rouet. Well, Franz Massen trying to finish off, perhaps with a good result for Word Perfect today. And that would wipe away the memories of a rather poor Tour de France for them. The big battle continued in the Tour between Alcala and Armstrong in the early part anyway. If you remember, it was Armstrong who lost the Tour du Pont in the United States to Raoul Alcala. But it was Lance Armstrong who won the stage in the Tour de France at the expense of Raoul Alcala. Those who have the legs now will be the only men who will take part in this title at the front. There's Franz Massen, a nice guy and a real nice bike rider. And Rue it is who's up here with him. And Claudio Chiapucci is the man who's forced the attack. So the counter-attack has come. They wipe away Barney Reese and they take on the offensive as well. And that was the tactics of the Italians throughout in the chase. Fondrias tried to do it, but was clearly closely marked. They, they often do misjudge the strength of Claudio Chiapucci. And he tends to find himself operating in a lot of space. And that's big Miguel Injurain who's coming. This is the big showdown. Injurain now has decided it's time to go. 
We haven't seen much of him all race in his Spanish jersey there, but Indurain has gone across. And the chase is on now as the riders try to scrabble across the junction. The World Championship at last is beginning to come to the boil. And there's Lance Armstrong trying to come across here, the American rider. Now, we haven't seen Lance all day, but he knows he's going to make a move now. That's a marvellous attack by Lance. And Dagotto, who has been in the attack these last few laps, driven on by the cheers of a home crowd, has realised the names in that front group could be the names of a world champion today. He's going across the gap. This is the big chase down. Armstrong is up here. 112 has come on the back. He's Claudio Chiapucci. And Fran, uh, Miguel Indurain is here, Gerard Rue, and the rider setting the pace, Franz Masson. Well, this is a perfect piece of timing by some of the great names in the sport. Now, suddenly the World Championship has shaken out the names that we know so often. Except one, Lance Armstrong of the United States. First year professional rider. He tickled the pro sport last year with some great results after what he saw as a rather bad 14th place in the Barcelona Olympic Games. There he is going down the outside, just checking out, seeing if this is a good move or not. But what a mature rider he is, 21 years of age. And looking good. Lance Armstrong, the Motorola team joined the Tour de France, announced a further year's involvement in the sport, and that brought a great sigh of relief, I think, amongst the men of Motorola. They knew where they were going for the next season. And... Uh, at a time when the economic recession is setting off a lot of teams and a lot of riders, good riders, aren't having contracts renewed. Armstrong able to concentrate on what would be an unbelievable world title today, but he's got some competition. Miguel Indurain being spurred on by the thought of the big three wins this year. The world's number one. No sign in this race at all of Tony Rominger. Gerard Rouet, always the man who nearly makes it. Tremendously talented bike rider, but never gets the big names. There's the teams uh, on the lead, Indurain, Rouet, Kipucci, Masson and Armstrong. What a break. It's not over yet, though. If only our camera could pan back, because the chase down is still there. They're still coming, but this is a powerful group. Over the top of the climb, then we start the descent. Armstrong leading from Franz Masson. Indurain has made the move this year. At Benidorm, he came so close to victory, but he had to be pushed back into sixth place in the sprint. He'll remember that now. But the rider who beat him then, Gianni Bugno, out of the world title today. Still a lot of Dutch riders there. They will now defend handsomely for Franz Massen because they'll share in the spoils. Very often, if the rider from Holland wins a world title, he gives away all of the win money and also has to pay even to the riders for their services as well because they see him as earning his future fortune as a world champion next season. So it often costs uh, a rider from Holland quite a lot of money uh, to win the world title. But I don't think Franz Massen would worry too much about that right now. There he is, tacked at the back of the group. Five very, very talented men. And Miguel Indurain, perhaps the most talented of them all. Eddie Merckx uh, said it during the Tour de France. He felt that Miguel could win at least three more Tours de France. I'm not sure I'd like to see him do that, but uh, if he could, he'd be the first man winning six Tours and taking the record away from Merckx, Eno and the late Jacques Anquetil. Little gaps beginning to open. Not a working unit we might expect to see, or are they a little bit frightened now? Because this is the treacherous part of the circuit where they've been going down throughout the day. Armstrong himself, by the way, has fallen, and I believe on two occasions off our cameras. But there seems to be nothing with the way he's riding right now. Well, there's the tram going up, the tram that could so easily have uh, created a very hazardous situation when Raul Alcala went over those barriers earlier on in this race. He's out of the race now. There's the chase. It's not out of it by any means, is it? We're not on the last lap here. There's still the descent, the journey round the harbour, and then we're out on the final circuit. Still a long way to go, and a little bit too early to count one's chickens, I think. And there's the rider at the front, who would rather be in the lead, Dag Otto Lauritsen, a rider who will continue to chase to the bitter end. 
Down through a dangerous corner, shall we call it. Injury and bringing them through, breaking. A little bit of a wobble on his machine there. Armstrong sitting right back on the saddle. Getting a nice balance on the machine. Indrain's been down some of the worst passes in the world, but I bet he's never felt as nervous as he feels right now. Masson gently comes down too, and look at the gaps that form between the wheels. The fearless and the free. Again, Indrain is leading. Armstrong is second. Masson, Rue, and Kia Pucci. That's the order, and if anything you know, there's an escape group, and it's coming in, it's closing in, and uh, Dag Otto Lauritsen is the rider who's closing it down. Ten seconds is nothing on this circuit anymore. Not, not when Dagotto, the former Oslo policeman, who once had his legs broken in a parachute jump and told he would never walk again, never mind ride a bike at this level again, now in with a chance of being a world champion on home ground, forget it, he's going to go. Perhaps these riders now are out of it. Sean Kelly sitting at the back. Stephen Roach, by the way, has retired. He's felt he's had his moment and has come out. Still very much a serious chase down here. Just caught a glimpse there of another Danish rider sitting near the back. It was Johnny Welts, but now there's still confusion at the front. He's not working well. In fact, our cameras missed it there, but something seemed to have happened between Lance Armstrong and Claudio Chiapucci. They put it right, and they've come back up to the leaders. There's Rue, the workhorse. Masson always willing to go. Now, if it comes down to the sprint, injury himself can pack a punch, you know, when he wants to. Very rarely ever uses his sprint because he never needs to in a long-distance stage race. He rides them off in the time trial. But if he comes to a sprint, I think he'll deliver a good one. But the man he would have to take on in this group, I think, would be probably Franz Masson. Rue chosen the wheel of Indurain. Indurain chosen the wheel of the young American rookie, Lance Armstrong. What a season that man has had. The million dollar big three in June in the United States, a stage win in the Tour de France that followed that. Now he's in the breakaway, which could well be the decisive move in the world title. At worst, he'll be fifth. But that little group is coming across, and we know that Dagota Lauritsen is into that group as well. And driving it very, very hard indeed there, Dagota. He keeps looking up. Bjorn Rees has got himself back into that breakaway as well. So this is a tremendous chase down. We're heading up towards the penult the end of the penultimate lap and out into the final lap. This is the dicey part of the course as well. The surface of the road has been put down again here. And it's in the Dockland area. And just before the championships. There's Armstrong. Not overdoing it. What a strong, powerful rider he looks on the bike. Former triathlete. Comes from Texas. And in the absence of the great Greg LeMond, not here, of course, uh, having retired for the year, but promising everybody he will come back to Europe next year and have one great final season before he'll probably ride a little bit in the United States and then retirement will follow. But LeMond not in the world title. And could it be that we're watching the man who will replace him in the years ahead? Lance Armstrong now set himself up that the merging of the two groups, and this is now a powerful group, and says Bjorn Rees has come up, so too has Dag Otto Lauritsen. A German rider is Olaf Ludwig on the right. Now the big sprinters arrive. Now they'll have to start thinking again there. 141 is Andre Schmiel going through. He's a rider too who can pack a good sprint finish. And Dag Otto's gone. Dag Otto has gone with a long way to go. He really is taking this race home to Norway today, and he's ridden brilliantly. He's gone in the feed, too. He hasn't waited for the bell. Maybe he feels it's psychologically the time to test these riders, just as the two groups has merged. Dag Otto did a lot of chasing, not just with his legs, but with his mouth as well here. He chased those riders up to the group, and now he's attacked. Well, I'm not sure whether he's misjudged here, but he's running on some adrenaline, that's for sure. No reaction at all. Everybody looking at everybody else. Well, that's how you win stages of the Tour de France, too, and Dagota will remember 
His win is no mountain climber, yet he's won a stage at Luzard Den in the Pyrenees. And Masson has felt it's the time to go as well. Masson is going across the Dagotto. That will cause the others to react. They know the strength of Franz. Former winner of the Amstel Gold Race, former champion of the Netherlands. And surely now when they see Dagotto in the lead here, the adrenaline will do it all for him. He's going to get that cold, tingly feeling cursing, uh, coursing through his body now as he races through the start-finishing line to the belt. One lap to go in his home city of Oslo. And Dagotto Larsson in the lead in the World Championship with Franz Massen. Massen doesn't seem convinced he should go with this one. He keeps looking over to see if anybody's coming. There's the bell. One lap to go at the end of the most dreary world title races where it has been a battle of the riders who could stay upright as well as the strongest men in the world. And there is the King of Norway. And I bet he never thought on his 25th wedding anniversary he would see a rider from Oslo in the lead in the World Championships. The first time they've been here. And 100 years uh, since the first world title was held in the United States. And the United States not out of this one either. They still have a man in the group. And it looks as though, in fact, that man in the group is doing the work right now, Lance Armstrong, because there are three riders got together at the front, and I think Olaf Ludwig is the man who's got across. It is indeed Ludwig. He won the big bunch sprint in the Seoul Olympic Games five years ago, in 1988, and then turned professional with the coming together of the Germanys, but of course he turned professional so late in life and done so much with his few short years as a pro. Green jersey in the Tour de France, classic winner. Now can he be world champion? Dagotto will not be happy with these two riders. He will finish third if he takes them to the line. He knows that. But for the moment, he's willing to use their strength to try and open a gap. Doing all of the work himself, and the crowd know it. He wants more work off Masson. Masson not willing to come through. Masson unsure about this move. He still wants Masson to come through. Now Franz goes through. Word perfect, desperate for a big win. They've hardly had anything since the win by Raoul Alcala in the Tour Dupont. And although uh, Ludwig is up here, he doesn't seem to be at all happy either. He's suffering. He can't answer to the wheel there of Franz Masson. He couldn't follow it through. He won't like the climbs that are still to come because Ludwig is not a good climber anyway. And because of the speed they're going, I think he'll find a bit of a struggle. He might not make the top of the climb with this group. Well, there they are, the big three, bronze, silver, gold. Which order did you want? That's the way it is at the moment. And Dag Ottolorton, so close to the world championship in Utsumir in Japan in 1990, when he was brought down in that pileup by Dirk de Wolf, and he stood up and punched de Wolf in the face, but he never got back into the action. De Wolf went on to finish second, and Dag Ottolorton felt that his world championship, which he felt was his, had gone forever. Now he's back in Oslo. Ridden absolutely brilliantly these last five laps. He's watched every move. He's created most of them himself. And the eight men behind. And you can never, ever count out Claudio Chiapucci. Look at this. And if any man's going to spoil the party, it'll be him. He's ruined it for many top bike riders throughout the world over the last few years. And has become perhaps the big favourite of the crowds around the world because of the way he races. He doesn't believe in tactics, he makes his own up. And now he's trying to close down because it's Kia Pucci doing the chasing. These three men continue. Masson and Lauritsen doing the work. Ludwig seemingly not in the mood to help them out. And he is the man who would certainly win the sprint. Surprisingly, though, the other two feeling the lead is too tenuous to start an argument with uh, Olaf Ludwig. And for the moment, at least, they seem to be content to let him sit there. But now they've manoeuvred him. Lauritsen has manoeuvred Ludwig in front of him. But Ludwig in no hurry, happy with the wheel of Franz Massen. And the rain continues even on this final lap to return to this course. And the risk of falling still very, very real.
And this is the man who's trying to go now, trying to leave that leading group. And Dagotto has gone on the climb. Now Massa, for some reason, has allowed Dagotto to go. It may be he was wanting Olaf to take up the chase. Olaf defused, and the gap has opened, and Dagotto has gone, and the others are being picked up. The others are being picked up. Now, it could be, in fact, that Masson feels that the big names in this back group won't allow Dag Otto to escape. And he's feeling that it might be, make better sense to drop back because he has the sprint that could win this championship, but they're still going to have to take on Dag Otto, who is so inspired today. Dag Otto Lauritsen, clear. Being pulled now like a magnet towards the finishing line of his home country. His actual house is something like 500 kilometers away from Oslo these days, but he was a policeman here. And Lance Armstrong has somehow got up because, in fact, Ludwig is here and dropped, and Armstrong has sprinted the gap closed. Lance Armstrong has joined now Franz Massen. Now, will Massen pick up the tempo or go back? There's Bjorn Rees staying there in the pack. He must have some mixed feelings because he knows a Scandinavian, if not the same country, is now out in front. He may not want to chase down Dagotto. They know each other well. Masson has decided with Armstrong it's worth a chase back. Over the top at Ryan. Armstrong sitting handsomely there on the wheel of Franz Masson. Let's have a look who's leading the chase. Who else would it be? Claudio Chiapucci looking for somebody else to take up the attack. And it's coming too. Gerard Rue is going. And that, in fact, has pushed Claudio uh, Chiapucci to the back. And this is the chase group that's coming up now. The Italians have got themselves a few riders up in this league group. Marco Giovanetti is there as well. And so too, I think, is Fondriest. Three men, though, are better than one, I think. The way this race is going, quite clearly the fact that nobody is getting away. All of the riders in this league group are now fully committed. Armstrong, still in the thick of this action. The young American who has matured so quickly and arrived at the very, very pinnacle of professional racing in less than a year. And there he is, flying the colours of Motorola, the United States champion, a million-dollar winner this year in the United States at the same time, and a stage winner in his first Tour de France. You can't really ever dream of things like that happening. And we don't even consider the fact that he might soon be a world champion. Franz Massen so close to a world title for Holland now. And Dagotta Lawrence Lauritsen knows that the winner has an audience with the king. In Lauritsen's case, his king. The gap is still small. Our motorbike camera can't swing round and show us, but believe me, it is not very big. I have to say that uh, we should take our hats off today. This is Rue chasing across the gap. We should take our hats off today to the motorbike riders because in these conditions they've taken the same risks as the riders on the pedal bikes and done a great job. And this, in fact, is Armstrong who's leading the chase down and taking all the risks now. He's got the feeling, surely, that this could be a good one. Well, there's a rider absolutely flying across the gap. We haven't uh, got a name on just at the moment, but this is Armstrong leading through. Now it's the short ascent up the Ekberg. I think it's Rue. We saw him earlier from the helicopter, who's still out there, who's gone across to give us four leaders out in front. This is the remnant of the breakaway. Surely now the world champion is from this group, all the four in front, and from nowhere else. And there's Rue. He's contacted the wheel of Masson and Dagotto Lauritsen, but they should start worrying now about the world champion elect because Lance Armstrong's going. Armstrong has taken a lot of risk on the way down, and that showed a lot of skill. And now he's trying to go on the way up. A last climb of the Ekberg, and Armstrong is going for it, and, I, and there's an attack through, Rue is gone, but uh, Masson has got his wheel. And I just wonder how much now dagotto has got left. He's made his moves, he's tried so hard in this race, he's been swept up yet again by Masson principally and Armstrong. Rue's come on now, but the one man notably missing from the front is Miguel Ingerain, who found himself outmaneuvered by the attack by dagotto and Dagotto is in trouble here. Masson is going, and Dagotto has gone. Rue, so close to doing great rides in his career. One of the finest real professionals in France, Gerard Rue. And now he's knocking on the door of a good medal here. 
But what about this young American? He's shown no fear throughout his very short pro career of any of the big names in professional cycling. And now he's got himself a lead at the top of the Ekberg. Well, what a surprise this would be, but you could never in any way say it was a lucky win. Armstrong's uh, ridden his way to the front of this race. He's had every top rider around him, and he's dispatched them all so far. Rue, Masson, Dagotto, and in fact, this is Indurain who's now leading the chase, and look at his face. You don't often see Miguel Indurain look like that. Schmil goes through as well. Bjorn Rees, and gritting his teeth at the back, the former Seoul Olympian. There is Olaf Ludwig. Well, this is a turn-up for the book. Two times on the floor in this race, Lance Armstrong uh, wasn't really noticed in this world title till towards these last couple of laps. And now he's made his bid. Still in the rain, over the Ekberg. This would be an immense surprise to everybody if Armstrong was to pull off the world title. And he's left some great men here now, just scrabbling for wheels and trying to grip a wheel, that's all they want. Johan Museo is here as well, if it comes to a sprint finish, sitting there near the back. Winner this year of the Tour of Flanders when he was the champion of Belgium. Well, the new champion of Belgium is out today with a broken collarbone. In what has been a series of falls on every circuit of this greasy 11 and a half miles of Oslo. Armstrong cleared. It's no time now to look over your shoulder, Lance. Somebody once told me the race is right here and the World Championship could now be his for the taking. Well, the hat has gone in the pocket. It's come down to very serious stuff now by the 21-year-old. He won't be 22 till the end of this year. Well, I should imagine now that Jim Okovitz from Motorola is sitting on the edge of his seat. He'll be one of the youngest ever riders to win a world championship at professional level. And the gap is there for him now. It is there for Lance Armstrong, and surely that's big enough. Surely that's big enough. They've taken too long to organize the chase back. And it's going to tell now. Kierpucci wants help. But they're not organized at all. That's Andre Schmil who's gone through. Armstrong now can concentrate. The former triathlete. Unhappy when he finished 14th in the Olympic Games in Barcelona. He turned professional. He had success almost immediately. And this year has come out and had an absolutely unbelievable season. The champion of the United States, he won that title in the core states race in Philadelphia, which also was the, the end of a trifecta where he picked up three straight wins and qualified for a million dollars as the winner of all three events. And then he took his Stars and Stripes national champions jersey to the Tour de France before pulling out of that race, which was planned. He took a stage there as well. Second in the Tour Dupont. If he's going to win a big time stage race, he'll have to work a little bit on his time trialing. But he's not going to be worried about that right now. He's thinking of staying upright and taking out the first ever world championship attempt for him. And he would certainly be remembered. The first time in Norway, and the celebrations of 100 years of the world titles. Not the road race, by the way, because uh, we only go back to the mid-20s for the first road race in the professionals. Still trying to pull together, but nobody in that group now has any way they can work with each other, and the gap is 18 seconds. They're trying, just snatching at straws here, using individual strength, and that, that's just about all Lance Armstrong has got left now, but what strength this man has and what a star of the future really is, even if he gets swept up now. He's made his move, he's made his mark. He's riding an Eddie Merckx bicycle, who was without doubt the finest rider the world has ever seen, who was a world champion both as amateur and professional. And uh, Lance is doing that frame proud right now. He's locked in this big, powerful man from Austin in Texas. And now he's stopped worrying where the rest are. He's got his rhythm and he's taking his chance. He's got all the skills one requires to be a top professional rider. He's not been afraid of what surely has been the most dangerous course he's ridden on this year. 
He hasn't dodged either all the falls. He's been involved in one or two himself, but now he's got the break. He did it so well. I don't really know why Lance, uh, why rather Franz Masson got away, let him go, because he was right there. He let him move away. It was almost as if he wanted some of the stronger men he knew, like Indurain, to join him. Perhaps he never felt that Indurain would allow a breakaway to go like this. But perhaps Indurain could do nothing about it. We all saw his face when he came up the last climb. It was hurting him. 10, 20 seconds. Two more seconds have been nudged out now. And still, they're not really organised in the chase back. They're looking at each other to take the chase. They're doing it individually, not as a group. And the man we could expect to win the sprint, Olaf Ludwig, is here. Even if it has hurt him, he stayed in the action. It's all easier going for him now. He should recover on the way down. But there's no way they're going to bridge the 20 seconds riding like this. There's not enough drive in this group. I think it's Fondrias, the Italian, who's got to the head of that chase. Kipucci's taking a back seat now to the better finisher, perhaps Fondrias, who will expect with confidence to go on to win the World Cup this year. But I don't think he's going to world, win the world title. I think we're looking at him. Lance Armstrong is going to take out this world championship in magnificent style. And nobody will ever say he was a fortunate winner. Fortunate to stay upright, perhaps. But he's ridden this race with tremendous strength. All the dangers are over now. Once he's round this curly bit onto the top road, it's a straight ride into the finish, and Armstrong can go with confidence towards the line. The gap is big. It's still 20 seconds. It might even be a little bit more than 20 seconds now. It might have nudged out just two more. Dagotto's got back to the front, still willing to race this. They're giving it straight 20. And in fact, that group has swelled a little bit more. One or two more riders have come up from the back. There's Bjorn Rees now there. He's had a great day out, but the moves for him haven't worked. While Armstrong sat and watched and took the gamble and then put in the one move he thought would work, and it has. And Keir Pucci goes again. Miguel Indurain chases him. The big battle, the two great rivals of the Tour de France fighting it out again, but only for second place now. Because Armstrong is on his way to a world title. It's unbelievable that the United States have already, almost on the eve of retirement for Greg LeMond, found his replacement. And that is incredible. Greg LeMond was a man for the world championships. We saw his silver medal and we've seen his gold medals. At world titles, he all began life as a junior world champion. He went on to win the Tour de France three times. And Greg hasn't finished yet. But next year, he was going, he's going to ride in the big pack of Europe alongside a world champion from America, and his name is going to be Lance Armstrong. 21 years of age for Armstrong, and I think Motorola are going to be rather pleased that they've already signed him for the team next year, because his asking price now would be a little bit heavy, I think. Andre Schmil, 141, been dodging in the rain squalls here, just staying near the front of affairs, almost unnoticed throughout this breakaway. But for now, for Lance Armstrong, the city of Oslo in Norway is awaiting him and the World Championship is going to be his. The riders have never organised this chase at all. They've gone in little spurts, but they've been chased down and somebody else has gone. And at the moment, I think here's Fondrias nearest the camera. There is Keir Pucci. They've got another little group trying to go and Keir Pucci is the rider who's refusing to take up the chase. Well, this will be Giovanetti. The only other Italian in this breakaway. It's all not worked out for the Italians, has it? They've monitored everything, and now they've allowed a man they never really suspected could lift the world title, and he's outwitted them all. Armstrong has gone, and he's left three good Italians in this group, Giovanetti, Chiapucci, Fondrias. And there he is, in the worst conditions you could imagine here. And if only you'd have seen yesterday, it was warm, sunny, and brilliant. And Germany found themselves a world champion in Jan Urich at 19 years of age. He was the youngest since Eddie Merckx, and now we're seeing possibly the youngest ever world champion here as a professional in Lance Armstrong. The days of the young ones in this world championships in, in Norway. And Masson, who surely is the man who's made the big mistake today, he was there, and he allowed the move to happen around him. In a sprint finish, I think fans would have beaten Lance Armstrong. But it doesn't matter now. Armstrong is winning in the style of the man on whose bike he rides, Eddie Merckx. 
A lone victory makes a great champion and one to be remembered, leave it to nothing. To ride home solo now is a matter of a mile away. And Keir Pucci never gives up, does he? He's got clear, and Keir Pucci now chasing alone. And he's got a good gap as well. He's got a very good gap, so Giovanetti there has given way to Keir Pucci. The last time through the pits, and if he's any helpers here, they'll cheer him. And the way that they can go to the finishing line, they can just about run through to the home straight to see Armstrong finish. He has to go around the city of Oslo now. But what a great feeling it must be for Lance Armstrong to race through the pits there now. Just about two kilometers, just over a mile to the finish, and the regrouping here. Well, with the exception of Kia Pucci, who's heading into the pits with that lead, and there's a charge down the far side of the road. And that'll be the counter-attack, which might well finish off Claudio. Injurain sitting at the back. And so too Bjarni Ries. I think his legs are played out. Hardly surprising, really, he's ridden a great race. But it just didn't work out for him. Two laps to go, it looked as though he was the world champion. Now we're looking at a man who surely will take it. The only thing that would stop him now would be a mechanical defect or a flat, and nobody would wish that on Lance Armstrong. This has been a brilliant championships for him. He'll sit back at the end of the year, and he's going to ask himself, what more can I do? I've done it all in one season. Stage in the Tour de France, the second in the Tour du Pont, the World Championship, to crown it all. His million dollars in the height of the summer, his American title. And this in 12 short months of cycling. It's hardly a year ago since he finished 14th in Barcelona and actually contemplated giving up the sport. Now he's looking back and seeing nobody as he becomes champion of the world. Lance Armstrong, 21 years of age, is America's second only world ever road race champion. And he's going to make the most of this. It's still a long way to the finish. He's just making sure nobody's coming. But they're not Lance, he's going to win this, he's giving away all his time games to salute the crowd, over six hours in the saddle. And Lance Armstrong, and I bet his Motorola team can't believe it, but the 7-Eleven, they came and they tried to conquer as Motorola, they've surely done that. They had a great Tour de France this year, Motorola, with Alvaro Mejia, and of course with Andy Hampston. And now with Lance Armstrong, they've lifted the World Championship, he shakes his head like he's come out of a shower, and that's just about what he's done. Look at this sprint now for second place. Museo taking the lead. Injurain, I told you he could finish. Injurain is annoyed and going to win the sprint for second place. Miguel Injurain takes a clear second in the silver medal. And coming up in third place, a very tight finish there from Museo. But Olaf Ludwig will take it right on the line and take the bronze medal. And Claudio Chiapucci there trails in at the back. John Hendershot. The first to congratulate the new champion of the world, Lance Armstrong. Well, Hendershot has seen it all. The congratulations are well due indeed. And I think Hendershot there biting his lip. It's quivering a little bit, and I'm not surprised. As the sprints go on now, this is Andreas Kapus, who's finishing in 13th place here, just pipping Adrie van der Poel, and the big field coming in, uh, fighting out for 15th place. Led home there, by the way, by Laurent Jalabert, the Frenchman who was a medalist last year in the World Championships. Well, can you believe that? The stars and stripes of the United States flying at the World Championships, and I think it's fair to say nobody really expected that. But from this young man, with the confidence he has exuded this year... Lance, you can't believe it, what you've done? I can't believe it. On the last train, I looked at my computer, I said... Maybe there's still one lap to go, but... Oh. Well, Lance Armstrong there being congratulated in fine star by Jim Okovitz, and now the long walk with his proud mother, Linda. And this is a man who one year ago was an amateur cyclist with a very poor, in his words, Barcelona Olympic Games, now the champion of the world. And he's beaten the men that matter in world cycling because the rider leading him out to the podium now is none other than Miguel Indurain. Second today, but of course a winner for the last three years of the Tour de France, the last two years of the Tour of Italy. And in third place, taking the bronze medal, Olaf Ludwig, the former East German. Well, bitterly cold even at this stage of the game. But I don't think Lance will worry too much about that now. 
UCI official Werner Gerner presenting Lance Armstrong with the rainbow jersey of world champion. He'll wear this for his pride for the rest of this season and, of course, throughout next year. And the gold medal. Well, I wonder if Lance really believed this would be his today. His mother always said it was a course for her son when she saw it, and she was right. The high spot on the podium for the United States and for 21-year-old Lance Armstrong from Texas, beating the greatest man of the moment in world cycling, Miguel Indurain. He raised a smile there, but I think Miguel very disappointed because the 21-year-old American has denied him the big three wins uh, all that really remains in what is a tremendous career for him. And for Olaf Ludwig, a bronze medal now to match the gold medal of the Seoul Olympic Games in Barcelona when he rode for East Germany. So the big three riders in the World Championship, which will be remembered as one of the most difficult because of the course conditions, finding a winner from the United States. I'm Phil Liggett, till next season, saying goodbye.